Dale Clemens, how long did you serve in the U.S. Navy? Uh, about three, a little over three and a half years. I uh, signed up in uh, June of, six, of 1968 and served until the end of January in active duty, uh, 1972. 1972. Did you say reserve after that? Yes, or? In, inactive reserve. Oh, yes. inactive yes. reserve, right. so for a few years. Yeah. Right. So you said joined up, <coughs> so this was your choice to, yes. to do that? Yes, yeah. What was, what was involved? You said June of 68. Right. So 68 was a tough year. Of course, you've got Tet early, you've got, right. um, you know, that famous photograph from Saigon. Yes, right. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, the... <coughs> <coughs> the um, South Vietnamese officer and the, right. and the, the Viet Cong guy. Um, Lyndon Johnson decides not to run for president. Looks like he's giving up. Yes. Um, Martin Luther King assassinated right, right around that same time. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of unrest in the country. Right. Um, so all that's going on nationally. Yes. Where, where, where were you living at the I time? Was, I, was, uh, I was still, I was actually going to summer school at Oklahoma State University. So you and I graduated in August of that year, so I was in summer school. Okay. Uh, uh, my original intent was to become a veterinarian. Oh, okay. But I didn't study. Oh. So I was fixing to graduate, didn't have a job. Navy recruiters were in the student union. I had just happened, yeah. to, my brother and I happened to go in the student union and they were there. Yeah. I was always, I was always interested in airplanes, kind of wanted to fly. Really? And, uh, in fact, I initially, was first, my freshman year in college, I was in Air Force ROTC at Arkansas. Oh, wow. And then, uh, mm -hmm. so they were there and kind of wanted to fly, so we signed up. So was that really the main motivation, that you wanted to fly? Because, I mean, obviously it's, you uh, know it, that Vietnam's right. going on well, and all that stuff. Yes, it? but <laughs> frankly, I also thought it would be over before I got through training. Really? Yeah. Where I yeah. hoped that would be over before I got to the ring. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I, actually, as we joined up, I thought I was probably going to be a career uh, person in the service. Career Navy pilot? Yes. Oh. Well, let's just jump ahead. Why, why did you end up serving a few years rather than 20 or 30? <clears throat> well, it, you know, I did end up going to Vietnam. And, and uh, frankly, I, I was fortunate to be there at a time when, the, when there was no bombing in the North Vietnam. Mm. It was for, for me compared to you know the guys on the ground and the helicopter pilots and the, mm. the guys on the river boats. I mean, it was a piece of cake for me compared to what they were doing, and, mm. and it was it became obvious we weren't accomplishing anything. I say I became somewhat frustrated, and as I, I said, see. I initially kind of wanted to be a veterinarian, and mm -hmm. I said, well, I'll go back to school, study, go to med school maybe instead of vet school. Yeah. Well, the military is good for that, right? It's helping you. Yes. If, if you're not going to do a career in the military, at least for some of us, it helps us get serious right. about what other things That's we're right. <laughs> exactly. I, I, this happened to me, I think, about three weeks into boot camp when I realized that the Navy and I weren't necessarily going to have the best relationship. Yeah, right. And so uh, I should probably start thinking about yes. you know, yeah. what, what comes and next. And I got very motivated mm -hmm. and very serious. And, yeah, I, I know what you mean. It, the flying was fun. Yeah, but the other some of the other aspects, as you know, aren't necessarily sure. fun. Well, yeah. and for, I mean, obviously, I was peacetime, peacetime Navy on a, on a carrier, which I think is about the safest place in the world yeah, to be. Right. But, um, um, so when when you decided to join, then your thinking was, you know, this is a, a great potential career being right. a pilot, mm -hmm. um, and the war will probably be done by the time I get through yes. training, and so I right. won't have to do with, yes. with all that. Right. Um, so then do you remember, you know, it's obviously a long time, when the orders come in that, okay, now you're heading to the South China Sea and you're going to be flying missions over Vietnam. Um, was that kind of a bit of a reality check for you? Uh, well, I, th I think probably earlier than that, that you know, when you're in uh, officer candidate school, mm -hmm. uh, as, as time goes by, then you, you have to make a decision about what you want to do at that point. And there are several choices in those days compared to what there's today. Yeah. As far as, I was actually a naval aviation officer, and which is, uh, my vision was not good, so I was not a pilot. I was a bombardier navigator. Mm. Uh, so there, there were a lot of different options. And uh, as a, as shortly after becoming an officer, then you have, then you start nav you know, basic navigation training. Yeah. And that's that, after that period of time, which is four weeks, I think, then you might get to make a decision what you want to do. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and your decision actually depended on your grades as to who got first choice. Right, sure. And there were, <clears throat> and uh, a lot of the guys wanted to be 
fighter jock. He's in, you know, flying F-4s. Right, yeah. Uh, that didn't appeal to me, really. Okay. Uh, was mm -hmm. Their job was not much, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, so the other option was, uh, I decided I'm either an A-6, and one of the reasons I picked A-6 was because you get to sit up front with the pilot. Yeah. You're side by side in the seat, so you're up there with the action, and wow. if something happens to him, you can kind of reach over and, you know, at least fly it until you get over the ocean and eject on your own. Sure, wow. Uh, wow. So, anyway, wow. so I, 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 one of my, uh, one of the officers was over the students, asked me what, what I plane I chose, and I said, well, A6. He said, well, well, that's the Navy Cross then. But, well, wait a minute, I don't <laughs> necessarily want a Navy, Navy Cross. That, you get the Navy Cross then, Maybe which is ne right next to right, Yeah, 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 so. Yeah. But anyway, I picked yeah. it, so I was, there was, was, and I, I still had a year and a half before I had to go. So. Had, I, knew, I knew it was going to go then, but if the yeah. war was still going on, so. So had your thinking changed then that now at this stage, you know, your initial thoughts maybe, well, it'll be over, so I won't have to deal with it. Now it looks like it's actually going to carry on, and of course it yes. does carry on for a few more years. Right. Um, had your thinking changed to now, actually, I do want to go and, and be involved? Uh, yeah, I was, I was willing at that point to go, yeah. yes, I'm not sure I wasn't wanting to go, but I was, yeah. I was willing to go, sure. That's yeah. interesting, because that, that's <clears> a, I mean, that's, it's a tough stage of the war, right? Post-Tet and, mm -hmm. you know, that year after Tet is, that's the, in terms of, for lack of a better way of putting it, I mean, in terms of body count, I think it's the right. toughest, yes. toughest year right. of the war. And then, of course, you've got a lot of social tumult, et cetera, in this country. That's a, that's a right. tough time. It's a really tough time to, to get into the war. What, what, had, what do you think had changed your thinking to that? Well, you actually do want to do wanna get involved? I'm, I'm not sure I remember. You know, I, yeah. my dad, I had, uh, during the whole process, we had instructors all through the process that were going back and not coming home. Wow. And uh, even my, my first drill instructor went back and didn't come back. Wow. And we thought he was too tough to die, you know. So, oh, yeah. so it, it sort of sets in gradually. I think I'm not sure I, there was a aha moment where, whoa, I gotta, I gotta go, yeah. and I may not come back. Uh, but it's not. Um, it wasn't. It sounds like it wasn't necessarily a gung ho thing, but more of just a sense of duty right. and obligation. Right. Yeah. Do you think it may partly have been, um, you know, look, those guys went, they did their duty. They didn't make it home. I have some responsibility, not only to the service, not only to the country, but also to I them. I think there was some of that, that yes. Mm -hmm. A little bit of yes. responsibility and then, to And uh, I ended up having a gun old pilot when I got to my squadron as well. He'd been a uh, tanker pilot on A3s, and he oh, okay. was actually a fairly senior lieutenant commander. Wow. So this is going to be, you know, he'd, he'd been probably over Vietnam, but not in combat, essentially. And, yeah, uh, yeah. So he was gung-ho to get there. You know, okay. That leads to a story I'll tell you later, maybe. So. Well, let's tell it now, otherwise okay. I'll forget. Okay. Yeah, yeah, otherwise I'll well, forget to Well, our, our it. first mission uh, over Vietnam, and, yeah. and again, our most our, our job was to do was mostly road interdiction to prevent trucks and supplies coming down from North Vietnam to get you know. On the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Right. On the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Let me just let, let's just look at a uh, look at a map here, just so we we know what we're looking at. There's your plane. We can come back to that, um, but. Uh, so there's a map. Okay, so, so I'm sorry. Pick up where you were. Okay, <clears throat> so we were out in the Tonkin Gulf. They're s essentially uh, east, a little bit north of Da Nang. We typically fly in just south of the DMZ uh, yeah. along the trail and go north south along the trail to do uh, bombing runs. Mm. Uh, so anyway, our first our first mission, the first day on the on the line, we were the last flight to go that day, and uh, so they were a little slow in getting the bombs fixed. So we went up the flight deck. We had two bombs, and normally we'd carry 22. Normally you had 22 bombs. Right. This time we had two. two. Wow. And the, nec the plane next to us didn't have any. So they took one of ours off and put it on his. <laughs> he, Each plane has one bomb. Yes. And hit. Wow. But that pilot immediately downed his plane. Really? But my, my pilot was ready to go. So they took his bomb off, put it back on ours, so we took off two bombs. <laughs> normally you have 22. Right. Um, and so you're off to, to hit the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Right. So yeah. just tell us real quick, um, you know, what the Ho Chi Minh Trail was and, okay. and why, again, why are you hitting it, and then we'll come back to your again, story. Again, was, <coughs> that, that's where they got most of the supplies came down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It, it, it really was probably hundreds of trails, but yeah. uh, the war had been going on a long time before we got there. So you, you could see it from miles away because it looked like the moon 
I mean, there's so Those many bombs. Trails just been yeah, hit. it's just pockmarked. Like so right. right. Yeah. So, most a lot of those missions were at night. Our first mm -hmm. one was not. A lot of those were at night, and so yeah. you hope to use radar to pick up trucks because they turned the lights off or something. Right. Yeah. And uh, but in the daytime, oftentimes you'd look for trucks or somebody would tell you maybe there's trucks there, but yeah, I never saw a truck in the daytime. So yeah. they would give you a secondary offset target. Yeah. to hopefully hit a supply depot or something, or something like that. So yeah, so the Ho Chi Minh Trail, you've got these, you've got this war material and troops right. coming down from North Vietnam, right, um, and then making their way through Cambodia and Laos, right, right and then right. into South right. Vietnam. Right. So you're hitting this trail to try to stop that that, right. that supplies, supply, yes. you know, the the supplies yeah. and the and the troops coming down from the north to the mm -hmm. south. Okay, but, so but that's so what was frustrating because you know, as soon as you drop the bomb, they come out and with picks and shovels and cover up, you know, fix your hole. So we didn't stop anything. Yeah, it's pretty, uh, well, okay, so uh, uh, we're going to get back to your okay. story, but you, you say things that make me want to ask other questions. <laughs> okay. Um, it's pretty astonishing, really. I mean, it's a, you know, Vietnam's a developing country now. Yes. You know, but when you're flying over this country, it's a poor, mm -hmm. undeveloped right. country. Where not I don't mean this in a critical way, just in a factual way. A lot of the, a lot of the guys, our guys are fighting are running around basically in flip flops and pajamas. Yes, you know. Right. And the U.S. is just sending so much uh, mm -hmm. power, right, military right. power in that country. But then you get like what you just said. You know, we're bombing the heck out of the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but they come out with what's what's your kind of in your own mind? What's your explanation for? how the South Vietnamese and the North Vietnamese allies were able to to pull this off because they were so incredibly outgunned. Yes, well... You know, what, 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 do you, what do you think about I that? I think they just had uh, they just had the will to win and South yeah. Vietnamese people, I think, you know, gradually, well, maybe not gradually, probably initially didn't, didn't care who won, particularly those folks out in that part of the country because they were away from the cities. They were just out there trying to live a life. And uh, mm -hmm. we're, everybody, North and us, were interrupting their lives. Mm -hmm. So I think, and then of course they were um, had some brutality from both sides. More so, I think, probably from the North. Mm -hmm. And so they just uh, swapped sides whenever they needed to. And uh, so a and high degree of commitment, right, from I think the it's communist right. nationalist side, right. A relatively low degree of commitment right. from those stuck in the middle, right, and and corruption from the government of South Vietnam. Uh, yeah. Uh, in, in my own view, this this was, and you may have a different view, but in my own view, the fundamental problem was that the government of South Vietnam was never able or willing to win the loyalty right. of its own people. Right. I think that's right. the... Yeah. Right. Well, so anyway, so you're, 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 you're hitting the, the trail, and so here you take off with two bombs, and so with, yes. with your gung-ho pilot, right. so to finish that story. Well, <coughs> yeah, I think our first mission was... was close to the trail but not exactly on it as I recall but so then uh, those missions like in the daytime you'd go check in with a forward air controller from the Air Force who were flying missions out of uh, Laos and they'd, you'd, you'd join up with them and you'd have to tell them who you were okay. and how, what your bomb load was yeah so and they're, I, these are the guys who are telling you these are the targets right oh, yeah they're yeah. flying OV-10s mostly and what they, they had they had marker rockets that they would shoot on the ground and say oh. drop your bomb five clicks to the southeast of that marker. Or five miles, very, that roughly five miles. A little miles. less than that, but, yeah, okay. but a little less. so very inaccurate, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and we never, I never saw what we were trying to hit. Never saw what we were trying to hit on wow. the ground on daytime vision things. Yeah. Well, well, one time I did, but there was, I never saw an enemy on the ground. Really? Except on the radar at night a couple times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, you had to check in with Ford Air Controller and tell them who you were and how much your bomb load was. And so normally say, you know, I was 22, 500 pounders. Mm -hmm. So as I got, I say, well, I've got two, uh, what'd you say? I've got two 500 pounders. And he says, do you have trouble getting off the deck with that load? <laughs> yeah, being a little sarcastic. <laughs> yes, yeah. 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 Wow. So what did you do with those two? We dropped them where he told us to. Yeah. 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 So. Now, what the, the the connection to the gung ho pilot is is that because well, he, well, he took you know that the other pilot just grounded his plane. Probably didn't have anything wrong with it, but he's not, not going to take off with one bomb. Yeah. So, but my pilot was ready to go. 
yeah, with one. He probably would take it off with one bomb. Yeah, so, we're just yeah, gonna, yeah. Yeah, gonna go go yeah. go get into it. He was a career guy. Yes. Okay, so that might right. explain that might yeah. explain a little yeah. bit. Of it. But let's. Uh, but he 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 had yeah. he was a senior. He was probably a third senior officer in the squadron. So I had got to do a lot of stuff because that other people didn't get to do too. So oh. it, was, you know, it was very good. Yeah. yeah. What what was your rank at the time? Lieutenant JG. Oh, okay, yeah. so two. Yeah, so the, yeah. the next lowest. Right. Or the yeah, it's right next to the bottom. <laughs> right, that's right. So Ensign and then right. L L L right. Lieutenant KG. Well, let's uh, let's look at uh, at some of these some of these photos here. Uh, let's go back and and just look at this. It's a USS Midway. Just what what comes to your mind when you uh, when you see that well, photo? The, uh, the Mid Midway had been uh, reconfigured, I think, twice. It was originally made the the uh, hull was made to be a cruiser. Oh, really? And then in 1945, they decided they needed another aircraft carrier, so they, they converted it to an aircraft carrier. Okay. Uh, this is actually a, the second deck on the aircraft carrier, and it, it was put on just before our mission. So we got to fly kind of in a new, somewhat new carrier that was reconfigured. It actually had the largest flight deck per area of any aircraft carrier at the time. Really? Okay. Although it, was, it wasn't as long as Enterprise or some of those others, but yeah. it had the largest flight deck. And it, we, it just had three uh, catapults, the others normally had four. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, what's your speed uh, when you're when you're um, getting catapulted off these things? Thirty knots. Thirty knots. Yeah, and then so into the wind so that yeah, so that if you're uh, right. So if the wind not you know if the wind's ten knot miles an hour, ten knots, fifteen, then you're you know forty five knots. Okay. What's what's knots for those of us who don't know? A little that. over a mile an hour. Yeah. One point three miles an hour or something like that. I can't remember yeah. exactly. Wow. Yeah. So you are getting catapulted off this thing. Right. And then you have to land and catch the yeah. cables right. and coming back down. Yeah, the, the takeoff is about three seconds and the landing's about two and a half. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And how many uh, how many times did you fly off the flight deck of the midway roughly? Um, off the midway, probably a hundred or a little over a hundred. Uh, I had a few a few landings on the constellation, but okay. Yeah. Is that that was just a tr carrier qualification training oh, on the I Constellation. See. Okay, yeah. but all of your Vietnam-related right. services is Midway. Right. Yes, yeah. sir. Um, now, how long w were you off the coast of Vietnam? I mean, so you know, your Marines are basically they've got a year mm -hmm. tour in Vietnam. Right. With some leave right. Army, or the Marines have 13 mm -hmm. months. Army has 12. How, what's what's a tour on the Midway okay. related to Vietnam? Tip what is that? Yeah, typically. Like? I think it uses about eight or nine months, but you have okay. uh, what's called line periods where you spend about four or five weeks uh, on the line, and then you go to QB Point, usually the Philippines, to re resupply and have some time off. Okay. Uh, and then you go back for another four or five line periods. Again, because it was 71 and, and there's less action going on, we actually mm -hmm. had an extra, we had one line period we skipped because there's another carrier came out there and it wasn't enough for two carriers to do, so we oh, got to uh, take a, yeah. a break and go to Hong Kong. Well, oh. That was a more of a four-week break yeah. there. So, so I think we only had I think we only had four line periods total. So line means where we were like in off off the right, coast. Right. How how far off the coast would the carrier be? Oh, mm, probably sixty to hundred miles. It take it take fifteen or twenty minutes to get to the land. Yeah. Okay. And so each line you you're basically doing circles in the South China Sea for about five months right. Something, right. or five weeks. Right. On the right. river, something like right. that. Right. And then let's look at uh, at your plane. Just tell us about um, about you know your work on this. Okay, on this it's, it's an A six A intruder. It's it's it was a uh, a night and all weather attack plane, as you see, which means in the Navy that means a bomber. Yeah. So it's yeah. kind of a medium bomber. We could carry a very large load. That load there, I think, is twenty two five hundred pound bombs, which is considerably more than a B seventeen could carry, actually. Particularly really? short missions. Now those, so those bombs that we see there, those weigh 500. Those look pounds? like 500 pounders, yes. Wow. Wow. Now, how how accurate can those things be? I mean, well, these days we have precision right, bombs. Right. Yeah. And in so in those days, um, what you you had a, you had a when we when you practiced the bombardier never got a grade on how far you hit from the practice target. Okay. So a good a good one would be 100 feet, on average. Within that range, yes, yeah. within 100 feet of the target, wow, would be actually wow. pretty good. Yeah, but you were carrying so many bombs, you hoped that would be good enough. Yeah, yeah, right. So, what's the what's the normal practice then? You, you've got a target. 
you know that you're not probably not going to hit it you know, right. directly. So is, you've got a target. Do you just unload everything on that one target, well, or what's the what's well, mission like? On the, on the mission, we would, yes. On, in practice, you carried actually 25-pound bombs with a shotgun shell in the, in the front. Oh. And you drop one at a time with those. Uh, okay. On a, and we actually used radar for bombing. The radar was a computer-guided radar, but it was uh, built in 1950s. Oh, okay. So it wasn't much yeah. of a computer. And it was actually uh, analog, so the whole time the computer was running, you had these numbers rolling, and you could hear them clicking, rolling all the time. Yeah. Uh, it also wasn't very uh, reliable. You had to mm. often reboot several times. Yeah. But anyway, you would, you'd have a target that was offset, so you, you so you'd put the angle and distance into the system, and and the, and the computer, the plane determined speed and altitude and wind, correct. And you had a little stick that you'd adjust on the target to correct it for wind. Oh, okay. the, the, you know the bombardier navigator head, yeah. and, and you actually had your head stuck in a screen, so you could see the radar screen, and the light was out. And this, this is what you're doing, right? At least yeah. on the bombing runs. Um, so now on, on most of these bombing runs, then when you go bombs away, that's your whole your whole right. load goes in that one thing. Right. So then, how long would a typical mission last? You fly um, off the yeah, midway, it, it, and we how were pretty. Long you know, of course, not that far across Vietnam to Laos, so yeah. two two and a half hours would be a long one, maybe two to two and a half hours. Okay, and then and then the actual bombing run itself is twenty seconds, thirty seconds. <laughs> well, seconds. yeah, we had yeah, again we had the bombing. You know, I was talking. We have two different kinds of bombing runs. One was was radar guided. The other was what we men mentioned with a forward air controller. Mm -hmm. With those, you'd actually roll in like the old bombers would do. You'd, you'd fly at maybe twenty thousand feet. The pilot rolled the plane upside down and pulled the target the nose to the target and where he's and he's looking at a bullseye on his above his screen. Wow. And he puts Upside that on down. Yeah, he puts that on the target and he rolls back over. Wow. So then you're flying down at fifty, sixty degrees. Yeah. And in that in that case then uh, he's just trying to adjust his you know, by stick what whether he's gonna hit or not. Wow. And the, in that case the, the, my job at that point was just to call altitude. Call altitude. Nineteen thousand, eighteen thousand, seventeen, sixteen, fifteen and we couldn't in, in 1971, you couldn't fly below 10,000 feet. So at 10,000 feet, the, we'd say pickle pull, which means pickle the bombs and pull up. You couldn't fly below 10. That's right, because the, um, as you may not know, the F-105s in the Air Force lost 90% of their planes in the, in the late 60s because they were trying to get on target so good that they, but they flew too low and they got yeah. shot down with small arms and you know anti-aircraft fire. Yeah. So they made a rule. I'm not sure when that went in. Probably 70. Yeah. That you couldn't blow f go below ten thousand feet. Do you think that was a good rule? Was well, for me. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Made, uh, made it less accurate bombing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I hear that. Now you you said um, that you never really saw the enemy except on radar screen. Right. Um, were there cases where, though, you were aware of the enemy because your plane took flak or or something? Well, like that, again, or? it's not only twice did I have. Uh, an experience like that. One was we were flying in, uh, at night in clouds mm. and uh, they, we had a missile warning come on the plane and it was right after we dropped the bombs and I was looking out the right side of the plane and the pilot was looking out the left side of the plane and, and this warning thing goes off and we both you know, look oh. at each other because you could push yeah. a button and make it test. You could push a test button and make it go off so we both thought the other one was kidding the other guy. Oh, no, so yeah. in, in the clouds it's not fun to try to avoid a missile because you can't see it. And what, what you're supposed to do if you saw a missile was turn into it, keep turning into the missile so it could, you couldn't turn fast enough to get you. If you're in the clouds, all you could do is just uh, roll over, go down, come up, roll over, go down. So I think they were hoping you'd fly into the ground just really? by turning on the radar. Oh, that time. I see. Uh, and the other time was... No, that, that was for real then? I mean, you, you I don't, had... We never saw a missile, never so saw I don't know. They might just turn on the guidance system. Yeah, so yeah, They yeah. could do that without firing a missile, actually. Sure. And the, you know, the other time was actually on my birthday uh, when we were doing a... We were doing a mission that wasn't particularly fun. It was what I call Wild Weasel, uh, where you carried a missile to, and you hoped that they would turn the radar on you so you could fire a missile at the radar for the SAM, oh, SAM yeah, site. Yeah. So it's kind of like looking for rattlesnakes. You're looking, but you don't really want to find one. Uh, yeah. So uh, anyway, we that mission, and we were down close to Cambodia on that mission. And then uh, as we were we were, we were flying away, actually we turned, gone back north, and uh, 
somebody somewhere else on, in the air said they're shooting at you. But they were way behind us, so wasn't close. I um, see, okay. So, so it wasn't one of those situations where you land your plane, get off the plane, look at it, and see. Right, no, I, and again, I'm, I was again, I was fortunate not to be there at, yeah. the, at the time when that yeah. was happening. There were, there were still apparently sites there, but we, we just never, mm -hmm. fortunately, never got yeah. any serious trouble. Yeah. And at the time, I was more scared than any time was in a uh, air show in the United States. Oh, really? <laughs> you, you were one of the. Yeah. Right. And you were on one of the planes. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. So. Yeah. Well, so when when that when that missile alarm went off, um, did anything really change? Because what I hear a lot from vets is, you know, um, in those kinds of moments, uh, in a way, things almost become kind of robotic and your yeah, training yeah. kicks in and you're right. not really thinking and right. there's yeah, no philosophy a, and all that, right. you know, the meaning yeah. of life is just like, that's right. you know, you the just, training kicks in. Just do it and get out of here. So yeah, it, so. yeah. Long time ago, but I mean, after that one incident, you know, when you got back to the ship, you get into your, uh, your living quarters where there's that kind of um, moment like, mm -hmm. like, Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's just that's so far back. I don't, I don't remember having yeah, any yeah. recollection of it. I thought about it later more when some of my friends were in the worst condition and worst situations about them, really. So yeah, yeah. You mentioned earlier that um, you know your decision not to stay in the Navy was related to kind of the sense that you know this war in Vietnam. Uh, obviously, it didn't go very well, right. you know, from the U.S. Mm -hmm. perspective. Um, how long did, is that a realization that uh, you know that this realization must have occurred to you when you were in the country? Was that kind of a, a thing, a, a gradual understanding? Kind of, I'll just put it this way: a lot of time vets say, you know, they got to country, and then after a little while, maybe three months, they began to sense that, gosh. I, th know, I, th I think it was like that, weird. yes. And then after was six months, like, this doesn't make any sense at right, all. Right, it, it was more like that. It was just because of the repeti repetitive, doing the same thing over and didn't appear to be accomplishing anything. And, and again, it looked appeared to be the war was about over, too, uh, which obviously it wasn't. But yeah, uh, yeah. we're at least hoping maybe the war was about over because we weren't bombing north again. Did it feel to you like even though you're flying missions, even though there's still tremendous firepower in the country, that the U.S. was in a position of pulling out? Did, did I, I, that it seemed that, yeah, I, I sort of had that sense. Um, yeah. Which, which makes yet, sense. I, yet I was, you know, doing, during the mission, you hope, well, I hope I kind of do something when I'm out here. I hope I accomplish something that we're trying to accomplish by, yeah. you know, stopping supplies or yeah. that, sort of for the benefit of the guys on the ground. Yeah. Nothing else, yeah. Which leads me to think that if, you know, if guys in country are even though they're still at it, but there's still this sense that you know, but we're we're pulling out. I mean, this thing mm -hmm. is winding down. The North Vietnamese must have perceived the same thing. Yes. So all they need to do is persist. Right. Yeah. Right. Just wait us right. out. Right. Right. And 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 persist. Yeah. Um, a lot of vets say that that they feel that one of the real problems with the war was that, you know, on the one hand, there's this tremendous firepower that's mm -hmm. being used. But at the same time, there's a general sense that the military's hands were kind of tied in some basic ways right. as well. Do you, do, you, do you share that view? Yeah, we had, we, I'm not sure if this is true. I, uh, several issues about that. One, one of the main issues was that uh, on Ho Chi Minh Trail, you could not bomb more than 500 meters from the trail, even if you saw a target. So they knew that. And the, my, the only time I had an explosion was we had a bomb hang up, and then it came off. Oh. And we had a magnesium fire after the bomb hit. So, uh, too far from the yeah, trail. Yeah, right. And so was there so we had a truck, sort of probably a truck tires or, burn, or truck wheels burning or something. Mm. Yeah. So did you get into some kind of trouble for that no. or something like that? No. Or? So the all right. So I've never heard this before. So the rule was you can't hit more than five hundred. That's what we were told. Yes. I and don't know if that, don't know where that came from. Yeah, and but the motivation is probably you know we don't want right. civilians right, sure. getting hit. Right. But of course, the NBA and the VC know this. Right. right. Yeah. So if they put their stuff 700 mm -hmm. right. meters off the trail, mm -hmm. then they're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. There's something on the one hand, it kind of makes sense, I guess, if you're yes. in the room making the decision. Right. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe. 
but it, it's it is yeah. kind of crazy. And, and the other thing that struck know. me many years later was, I, we had our missions. We knew what we were supposed to go do. That one little thing. Yeah. We knew nothing else essentially that was going on, right. other than what we you know in the news and we didn't. You're in your we, little world. We did a lot of news. And I, I suspect my commanding officer didn't know what was going on either. Yeah. I mean, he has told that this is what you guys got to do. Yeah. And yeah. Maybe even the air wing commander may not have known what we were doing either. So yeah. I don't know how far up it went before somebody knew that, well, yeah. maybe this isn't the right thing to do. Sure. Well, you hear this a lot. I mean, vets say, look, you know, I've heard a, a lot of veterans say, yeah. you know, I learned about the war 30 years later when right. I read books right. about it. Yeah. When I was yeah. in it, it was just me and the guy next to me. That was right. That exactly. Was right. The, yeah. The whole war. Yeah. And I, th I think the perp I think the reason we got into the war was a legitimate concern about you know the domino effect. Yeah. Because we didn't know. Sure. We didn't. You know, we maybe if we'd had more discussions with Vietnam themselves, mm. we would have known that they don't like China. They yeah. don't like Russia necessarily. Right. So uh, I don't think the dominoes were going to fall. And, it, and they didn't, in fact. Yeah. And Ho Chi Minh was a communist, right? But I think right. He was a nationalist first. Yes, that's right. Know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, and I also read a book that you know halfway through the war, Ho Chi Minh wasn't really running into the situation. I think that's right. Yeah, yeah the yeah, what I've gathered is that he <coughs> came sort of a figurehead, and yes. and you did have some fanatical right. communists right. who who were, were right. in command. So when when did you leave active active duty then? Uh, uh, seventy two. Jan the end of January seventy two. Seventy two. So right. things are definitely winding down at, at this point. Just tell and us what happened at that time was the same reason that I mentioned that I think they I think I told you three thousand. I think they released at about that time they released six thousand junior officers because of things winding down. Things are winding right. down. Yeah. yeah. So I sort of volunteered to do that. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your your reentry into civilian life. I mean, you know, I mean mm -hmm. that that process. I, it was pretty. Uh, it, it wasn't a big deal, you know. I think okay. the soldiers had it a lot worse than than I did. I came yeah. back to a fairly small town, and uh, I Wait, now where did you did you come back in San Francisco, Seattle? Uh, through uh, to Seattle. Well, I was, Oak, Oak, I was stationed in Oak Harbor, Washington, Whidbey okay. Island. Yeah. So, right. uh, yeah, so north of Seattle. Okay. So. Did I, you didn't, I didn't do anything this? through the big cities at all, really. I mean, okay. I, I, they didn't know what. So you didn't have to deal from. with any of this stuff no. in the airport. So that some of the guys, no. some of the guys had to deal with. Because I was, you know, as soon as I got out, I was in civilian clothes. So yeah, and I, I did fly, fly a few times early on in my uniform, and never had any problems other than somebody thinking I was an American Airlines pilot and asking me where gate such and such was. Yeah, yeah. When you got out in those first couple of years. Um, what was your disposition toward the war? Just forget it and move on? Or? Well, I, I, I kept in contact with some of my friends for a while. Yeah. So, uh, and then after I got out, again, I had a couple of friends that were killed after I got out. Yeah. Uh, so I sort of paid some attention, but gradually I, went, I came back and went to school and was busy. Yeah. Going to school. Yeah. How much, how much for you, sort of day to day, mm -hmm. is Vietnam still kind of a, a presence mm. in your in your mind in your life? I, I think a, l a little more than it was for a little more last few years. I think because you know more people are talking about it. Mm. Uh, but, you know, for a long time it wasn't in my mind essentially at all. Really? Really? Yeah. Have you have you gathered that um, you know that now or you know? Last year, I mean, we had the 50th anniversary of mm -hmm. the Tet Offensive. Which right. Is, you know, crazy. It's yeah. Times and I just, I did just read the book about um, the Tet Offensive. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And and again, you know, what you learn from that was they were essentially lying to us. The government was lying about how bad it was. Right. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah. That yeah. you know, the lights at the end of the tunnel. Even though we won the battle, kind of the sort of the end of the war, essentially. Yeah. That that whole thing, you know, yeah. it was a clear military victory but a psychological right. loss right. Uh, kind of thing. Did, have you gathered, so here we are just, you know, a bit past the 50th anniversary of Tet, kind of this major event of the war. Um, you know, there's more, have you picked up that there's more interest in, in, in veterans, 
you know, telling their stories and, and getting things yes, on the record yeah, over, the, right. over the past mm -hmm. few years. Do you think that's partly a sort of a life stage thing that a lot of Vietnam vets are now close to retirement or they have retired and they're kind of at that stage in life where, you know, you're kind of looking back and... It, it, yeah, it, I, it, I suspect that's the case and yeah. maybe more, again, maybe more for those guys that had a lot more difficult time of it than I did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When you when you look back on the war now, mm. just what's your what's your general your general sense of it? Um, well, you know, it was obviously a waste. I think of manpower and material on both sides. Mm. Yeah. Uh, not for them, well, from their point of view, obviously not. I think, yeah. but uh, and probably maybe for the they're, they're obviously the Vietnamese are probably having a better lifestyle now. Mm. You know, maybe and it may be because of the war they may have been. Worse shape, actually, if the if the hardliners had won out right early on. So I don't know. Their lifestyle may be better. Well, I think we can certainly say that in the long run, the communist side of the argument has lost. Yes. Uh, yeah. Right. To, yeah. I haven't been to old North Vietnam, but I have been to old South Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And regardless of what the the government calls yeah, itself, right. the economy is not communist. Right. <laughs> yeah. They've given up on that fantasy. Right. Um, and. Um, if you could, if you, you know, could, when you look back on the Vietnam War, change something, what, is mm -hmm. there anything that, that you would change about it? Well, I, I guess, I, I think not. I think a lot, you, you mentioned earlier about, you know, sort of hands were tied a bit. Mm -hmm. So I think, again, militarily, we could, probably could have won the war yeah. if we'd wanted to, but what would we have had? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, just factually speaking, you know, I think one uh, one nuclear bomb could have yeah, been right, or, or, or bombing yeah, more yeah. strategic ish areas in the north. Sure. Yeah. And I think it's probably a, a good thing that nuclear bombs weren't used. That's right. right? Yeah, exactly. But, I mean, yeah, just right, as a factual right, matter. Yeah. You know, and I tell my students that it's, it's worth noticing that the country <coughs> was willing to lose a war rather than yeah. use nuclear right. weapons. Right, yeah, that's, you know, yeah, that's good. I yeah. think that's a, that's right. a, that's a, a mm -hmm. worthwhile, worthwhile um, observation. Well, you mentioned, um, you mentioned uh, some of the, some of the, the fellows you, you knew who, who didn't make it home, and so this is one of the names you right. mentioned. Can you tell us about Ray? Ray was a uh, uh, all-American swimmer at Villanova. Oh. And, uh, he he sort of joined the squadron. He, he came in after I did, but to, you know, you have in the squadron you have a few guys you kind of run around with, and he yeah. was one of them. Uh, yeah. Really a great guy, and and uh, he was actually killed. I, he probably was flying a mission in North Vietnam in 1972, and had uh, actually sh I think shrapnel came through the windscreen and the windscreen, and uh, he was uh, the pilot called it. He was unconscious, but when he got, when they landed, he was already deceased uh, from right. a w head wound. Yeah, um, yeah. So. You learned about this. So that was kind of a shock because I was out then and I was kind of already, you know, acclimated to civilian life. And, you know, when you're in, you, you don't, it's not a, such a shock when somebody, you know, gets killed. Mm -hmm. And after, after you're out, it's, you know, kind of more difficult, I think. Was there, sometimes vets say that, you know, when something like that happens, there's almost a feeling of, um, I don't know, the only word I have in my mind is guilt or something like that, but a sense like, you know, why am I here in civilian clothes? I should mm -hmm. be back there, right? Did, did you uh, have any of those well, kinds of feelings? Or? No, I, I had a little different experience for the next guy yeah, we'll discuss, but okay. uh, it, was, it was more yeah. of a long-term issue with him. Yeah, Did when, 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 when you heard about Ray then, that must have brought you back to the right. world immediately. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you realize it's late in the game, mm -hmm. but this thing is still right. still for real. Right. So his name is on the Vietnam Wall there right. in D.C. Have you been there? Yes. Mm -hmm. and you've seen right. his name there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's uh, let's look at um, at the next name. So we have Scott Thomas. Tell yeah. us about Scott. Scott was uh, from Beaumont, Texas. He was actually an engineer uh, by training. Uh, he uh, he and I actually were in training earlier than with Ray, so I knew him longer than I did Ray. Mm -hmm. And so we ran around a lot in Seattle and Washington area and skiing together. Uh, he was actually in a different squadron. He was in VA-196. And he, he was killed in a uh, accident, on, uh, actually a 
operational accident, not combat, when they were taking off from a runway QB point, the plane pitched up and they both weren't able to eject. Oh, okay. So and the, the, ish, the thing about, strange thing about him was that for probably three years, I would, I would dream that I was driving downtown and I saw him pass me in the car. Mm. Yeah, mm. and they were so often, and you know, I was just be so happy that you know, there he was. Oh, you mean but downtown here? Yeah, I mean, where we yeah, are here right. in Salem Street, yeah, Arkansas. Yeah, So you would have a recurrent dream that yeah. he's yeah, that it, yeah, that he really wasn't dead, and that went on for about three years, and finally, I dreamed that he was dead, and didn't, didn't dream about him anymore after that. So wow. that sort of wow. took a while to get over that one, but yeah. good because I knew him a lot longer, I think, and. Yeah. And you don't expect them to die either in an operational incident, you know, mm -hmm. so that's likely. So mm -hmm. there's a there's a veteran here in town, you know him, Mike Mike Bryant at mm -hmm. Utah. Mike said something to me that's very striking. He said that um, sometimes when he's driving down the highway, uh, in his mind he's not driving anymore. He's back in his helicopter. Oh, uh -huh. yeah. Uh -huh. Do you have those? Well, kinds that was another strange, strange thing that that I dreamed even longer than that was that. Two th two things. One is I was I was dreaming that I was still in after I was supposed to have been released. And I, I said, what am I doing? What am I doing here? Oh. But even more common than that was I yeah. dreamed I was called back because mm. I was in reserves. So I was dreaming I was called back, but it'd been so long I forgot how to operate anything in the, in the airplane. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so you had to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have these dreams. I you know I have a PhD, but one of my stupid dreams uh, was that. Um, Somebody looked at my records and realized I didn't do fourth grade well enough, so <laughs> yeah. I had to go back and read right. fourth grade. Yeah. But in, in, in your case, it's a much more serious thing. Um, you, you brought in some you brought in some things. I want to be gentle with them. Um, just tell us about this here. What, what this well, that's is the, that's and actually what it means to you. Okay. Well, that's actually a, the flight helmet that I had, and this is in the uh, yeah. uh, markings of the VA-115, which were. At the time I was in VA-115, we were the Arabs. Yeah. And they changed their name obviously later to Eagles when the other when the oh, other war started. Yeah. So we were the Arabs. Yeah. We actually had a, a a camel in Seattle Zoo that was kind of our <laughs> mascot. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so this this is kind of the civilian coloration uh, oh, okay. for the VA-115. When you went yeah. when you went into a combat, most of us had their helmet painted either dark or camouflage colors. So, really? so if you ejected, you run around with a white helmet yeah, on your head yeah, in the jungle. Yeah. So, well, I said to you before we started filming, it, it, it looks very Star Trek to me. Okay. <laughs> you know, like it should, should have this. This is more. This looks Trek. more, you know, Top Gun there with a with a <laughs> sun shield down. Yeah. So you told us what it is. What does it mean to you? This oh, I, I think it just again, this memorabilia just reminds me of where it was. I guess. Yeah, that's very critical. Yeah critical moment yeah. in life. What is, what is this here? We have a, a, a bound... Yeah, that's, so, bound that's the flight log of all my flights in the Navy. Wow. And it, in it, peacetime, or right. I'm sorry, out of, out of combat right, zone. Right, and the very first flight zone. on, yes. Yeah. 1971 there is the, is the year. Now as you go through this, I mean, I don't understand any of, any yeah. of this that, that I'm looking at here, but you, I see names. Yeah, that's who you flew with. Belcher, uh, yes. Reddell, Williams, right. Lieutenant Commander Sullivan, Lieutenant Commander Seagwarth. Se yeah, Seagwarth was he was my, he was my pilot, all, essentially all the time in combat. So now when you, a couple of times you look at these things, I mean, do you have particular memories associated with? I that's another in, that's another interesting camera, issue again because because like. we were doing the same thing over and over again. Yeah. I only remember about three or four flights. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the the one when the missile right, I mean, the, then the, the gun, and yeah. then uh, one time we dropped a two thousand pound bomb, and they called it landing prep. In v actually in Vietnam, I don't know what they were doing. Like maybe blowing trees down for the helicopters oh, to land. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that one was different because right, it was actually yeah. in Vietnam. Had another another mission I remember because the uh, landing gear didn't go down, and so we thought we might have to land on the runway on foam, but that worked out okay. But you were able to get the gear down. Right. Yeah. So, wow. and so I, I just don't remember many. Yeah, and the, a lot the of flight, the flight. I, I had two flights with the Air Force. So I only remember one of those. With the Air Force. Right, and the, with OV tens with the Ford Air Controllers. Where my pilot, I went over and flew with them for one mission, a couple of missions, just to see what it was like and yeah. to get a yeah. rapport and know yeah. what they're dealing with and maybe yeah. what we're dealing with, kind of. That was fun because he he didn't know I wasn't a pilot, so he let me fly a lot. 
Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's Goes in the Air Force, everybody's a pilot. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me let me go back here and, and just to just to clarify one thing. Then, so you see the Ho Chi Minh Trail there, going down through Laos and and Cambodia. Right. Most of the runs you were involved in were they mostly Laos? Laos. Mostly we, we were not. We were not supposed to fly into Cambodia. Okay, so nothing in Cambodia. I'm not sure we were supposed to fly to Laos either, but okay. no, almost every mission was in Laos. Okay, every, almost every mission was in was in Laos. Um, and then tell us what we're, what we're looking well, that's at the, That's here. just the knee board that you wore on your leg that has uh, in instructions on checklists. and. Okay, for, so here's where it attaches to your Yeah, it goes under your leg, right. Yeah, and so here I'm looking, it says uh, ripple... What does that mean? That's a that's a that's a checklist for firing rockets, which we only did once, okay. and that was at uh, in Nevada. Yeah. So I, so we normally didn't do that, so I had to write up a special checklist to, in order to fire the rockets. So we actually did. I have the reason I kept it because we only did that one time. So I've got is that salvo? There? Right. Yeah. That's just salvo. a switch. Those are just switches you oh. have to turn on. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, Dale, if you, if you, well, let me, let me ask, I think I've, uh, let me ask this, this question here. Um, would you do it again? Well, I think probably, uh, I think probably I would. It's probably the best thing, one of the best, it's one of the things that you don't want to do again, but I, I would, but you don't want to do it again, but it's probably the best thing I ever did uh, as yeah. far as uh, yeah. my rest of my life, really. Because I, I, I had essentially no confidence in, Myself in college because I didn't do well in college, but because I didn't try very hard, mm. and I wasn't an athlete. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I just uh, and as soon as I started officer candidate school, I actually did pretty well. Yeah. Well, it sort of gave me confidence. I think sure. to do what. So it had a big, a great personal right. impact. Does it? I wonder if this surprises you at all. I mean, I've talked to a lot of veterans, and I've asked many of them the qu even some with I mean, really, really mm -hmm. tough. Uh, experiences and some of them are mass I've asked you know if I could give you a magic potion that would make all of those memories go mm -hmm. away would you drink it and only one has said oh, yes yeah. the, yeah, great, the right. great majority have said no I mean right. as tough as those experiences were and as tough as the memories are I wouldn't want to lose them does that surprise you that no I think not yeah what, what's your why, why? I mean, what's your explanation? No, I'm not sure. I have a good one. I think it's part of who you are, essentially. That's what they yeah. say. Yeah. Yeah. It's just to... It's kind of what made you how you are now, I think, yeah. to some extent. So. Yeah. What do you think is important for young people today to know about the Vietnam conflict? <clears throat> Again, I think for the most part, it was just people doing the job they were told to do, trying to do the best job they can for most of them. Mostly college yeah. age right folks right yeah. 18 19 right. how old were you i was when i i was i joined i was 21 when i joined so. when you look back you, you look at you know you look at 21 year olds today do you ever like have that sense like really i mean i was that <laughs> young with that kind of responsibility it's well, pretty mind-boggling yeah it? yeah it is people that mm -hmm. young are carrying that right kind of responsibility and, yeah, yeah. And that maybe to some extent not not maybe not mature enough to be afraid. Maybe sometimes yeah, yeah. until you get there. Yeah. yeah. Would you would you encourage young folks today to consider military service, whether it's Coast Guard, yeah, Force, whatever? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. I would because again, it's there's a lot of again it makes you get your attention. Maybe that's what it is to is to do. Well, maybe if I don't want to do this, I'll I'll work hard at doing something else. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And even right. if you do one stint, I mean the. You know, the, yeah. the benefits are great, and, and you serve the country. And as you know, you can have some tough, mm -hmm. tough experiences. And just to just to circle back to this, I mean, in your own case, you know, as as, as you've said, um, your job is very different from the guys who are out on patrol, right, getting sure. ambushed. Yeah. Or, but you know, still still some tough experiences and tough memories. And so we remember we remember Ray and honor his service and mm -hmm. we remember Scott and we honor his service and we honor your service. Thank you. And I'm really grateful that you came in. Well, thank you for thank talking you. with me. Appreciate it.